You know, this journey has been really good. I've been speaking about this topic at a number of universities yeah. and the number of people that contact me afterwards, male and female, it's been, um, it's been very rewarding doing it. Welcome to ICANN, a podcast about ophthalmology through a uniquely Canadian lens with Dr. Cedare Ziai and myself, Dr. Guillermo Rocha. This season, we have two new co-hosts joining us, Dr. Mona Dagger and Dr. Hadi Saheb. They'll be hosting upcoming episodes throughout the season. Season three of the ICANN podcast is brought to you by Bayer Ophthalmology. Thank you for your support. On this episode of ICANN, we are excited to introduce our listeners to Dr. Yvonne Bais, glaucoma specialist and past president of the Canadian Ophthalmological Society. Dr. Bais completed her MD degree, ophthalmology residency, and glaucoma fellowship at the University of Toronto. She is a full professor at the University of Toronto, Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, where she has trained many ophthalmology residents and over 40 glaucoma fellows from around the globe. Dr. Bies has co-authored several guidelines on glaucoma uh, and in 2020 oversaw several ophthalmology-specific national guidance documents related to COVID-19. She also developed, obtained financing, and organized the distribution of 1,200 slit lab breath shields for ophthalmologists across Canada during the first wave of the pandemic. Dr. Bies has published over 180 peer-reviewed scientific papers, 16 invited editorials, and 10 book chapters and has made over 500 presentations at meetings and symposia globally. Dr. Baez has received several awards during her career, including the Achievement Award from the AO in 2015, the Champion for Change Award from Women in Ophthalmology at the World Ophthalmology Congress in 2018, the University of Toronto Colin Wolfe Award for long-term contributions to CPD in 2020, the Mitzel Award from the Glaucoma Research Society of Canada in 2021, and last year, she received the International Scholar Award from the American Glaucoma Society, becoming the first Canadian and first female to ever receive this award. On July 1st, 2020, Dr. Baez retired from clinical practice, but is still involved in many ophthalmological issues, including women in ophthalmology, which we'll be speaking about in this episode. Welcome to the ICANN podcast, Dr. Baez. Thank you very much for inviting me. Yvonne, we've known each other for several years now. We met on the board of directors of COS, and I've always admired your work. And you have been a role model for many medical students, residents, and fellows over the years. You truly are one of these women surgeons who broke the glass ceiling in ophthalmology in Canada, and more specifically in glaucoma. You've published extensively, and one of the articles of interest that we'll be discussing tonight has been published recently in the Canadian Journal of Ophthalmology. The article is entitled Trends in Payments Among Male and Female Ophthalmologists in Ontario from, from 1992 to 2018. This article has identified gaps in pay and has revealed other interesting findings. Can you tell us more about this work? Well, I first would just like to acknowledge the other people who were involved in this project, because this was obviously not something I did alone. So my co-authors, Yaping Jin, Mei Li Canizaris, and Tina Falfelli have all contributed to this work, and I'm happy to discuss it um, kind of on their behalf as well. I think research, it's like a story. And before I talk about this story, I think it's important to see what led up to it. So I was earlier involved in a project where I was exploring the association of different generations and how hard people worked. We always hear that the younger generation, they're more interested in work-life balance. They don't work as hard. So I wanted to explore if this was happening in medicine as well. We're very fortunate in Ontario having a fee-for-service system that it allows for good studies of this nature because we only have a single payer, so you get very robust data that's very objective. 
we're not able to measure how many hours a person works in an office because we aren't able to obtain that information objectively. But we can use as a measure of that um, OHIP billings because you assume the more you bill, the more you work. So in this study, um, we looked at different generations and we compared when they were at the same age as another generation to see what their billings were, always correcting dollars for inflation. So the hypothesis was that the younger generations would have lower billings because they were more concerned with work-life balance. But that's not what we found at all. In fact, it was exact opposite. The younger generations were earning more than the previous generations at the same age. So when you, first of all, do research and your outcome doesn't turn out the way you wanted it or expected it to, you shouldn't stop there. You need to explore it more and see, was there anything else interesting? And what was very interesting was the large disparity found between male and female ophthalmologists in Ontario. And in fact, in this study, female ophthalmologists were billing 59 cents for every dollar a male ophthalmologist billed. So quite a large gap. Whenever I present this type of work and I stop there, usually the response is that the outcome is kind of dismissed. They say, well, it's obvious women are going to be earning less because women do not work as hard as men. And they're more likely to work part time because they have, you know, child rearing or household responsibilities. And I do have to acknowledge that that might be partly correct. But what we were able to do in this study as well was to um, consider how much a person worked by looking at how many patients they had in a practice and how often they were seeing patients. And when we would correct for those factors, okay, the gap was a little bit smaller, but there was still a, a significant gap. So that led to this current study that was just recently published in CJO. I kept kind of thinking about it. How can we look at it differently? How can we explain this um, unexplained sex gap in payments? And I thought, what if we looked at um, physicians in groups? Why don't we look at them as a full-time equivalent? So Health Canada has developed a definition of what is a full-time equivalent based on OHIP billings. So anyone who bills between the 40th and 60th percentile in a year is considered one full-time equivalent. If you are under the 40th, you're considered less than one full-time equivalent. And if you're over the 60th percentile, you're considered more than one full-time equivalent. So we looked at the data and we extended it now as well. So it's covering 27 years from 1992 to 2018. And we segregated by full-time equivalent and by sex. And there were some very interesting findings. The first is, as everyone has always assumed, the majority of females fell in the less than one full-time equivalent group. Now that Proportion has improved over the years. So in 1992, 73% of our female ophthalmologists in Ontario were considered less than one, one full-time equivalent. And by 2018, it was 53%. So although the proportion is decreasing, still the majority of females are less than one FTE. In comparison, our male ophthalmologists the majority of males are greater than one FTE, 46% of male ophthalmologists, and the proportion for males in the three different groups didn't really change much over time. So then when we looked at these um, different groups, the different FTE groups, and compared them by the sexes, male and female, in the one FTE group, there was no difference in earnings between males and females no difference in the number of patients in a practice, no difference in the number of visits. In the less than one FTE group, it was variable year to year. And in the final year, female ophthalmologists who were considered less than one FTE actually had higher earnings than male ophthalmologists. But in the greater than one FTE group, it was also incredibly interesting. 
you could see a trend over time that there was a divergence in the pay gap becoming larger with men having higher earnings than female ophthalmologists in that greater than one FTE group, despite both groups seeing the similar number of patients and having a similar number of visits. And this gap was not a small gap. In 2018, the final year of the study, it was equivalent to more than $160,000 a year that the average male ophthalmologist in that group was um, having higher billings than a female ophthalmologist. So I think that this study was very important because it, it does show us that yeah, a lot of the differences can be explained by differences in practice patterns between male and female ophthalmologists. But despite that, there still is a significant difference that's unexplained by how people work. And I think that's an important thing that we need to think about, both in terms of the workforce and also what is causing this discrepancy. But Vaughn, I, I think that's pretty surprising because, you know, this is a fee for service payment module. And by definition, these fee codes are gender neutral. Um, and so the fact that the gender pay gap exists after accounting for how much these individuals work, um, do you think that what you're seeing here is, is unique to ophthalmology? You know, I completely agree with you. It's uh, something you don't expect to see in a fee-for-service system because we're given a flat fee for service regardless of age, sex, or any other characteristics. So why should there be a pay gap? But it is seen um, in other studies using even the OHIP data from Ontario. And recently the OMA had a report and they found that the gross daily billings of male physicians in Ontario were 30% higher than female physicians, which amounted to a dollar figure of $432 a day. And then when they adjusted for productivity factors, they found that this gap decreased to half, about 15.6%, which still meant that half of the billing sex gap was unexplained. We've looked at ophthalmologists, but I always had a comparison group. We compared to all physicians, we compared to medical specialists, we compared to surgical specialties, and we found that they all had these unexplained uh, sex gaps. We also, though, looked at family physicians and dermatology separately. And it was interesting for family physicians and dermatology as well that the sex gap was all explained by differences in productivity as we measured by the number of patients in a practice and the number of visits. So there's something different, I think, in ophthalmology and maybe some other specialties that is contributing um, to this sex gap other than just productivity. Do you feel like male ophthalmologists are, are billing for more testing, more modifiers? Are, they, are their practices more procedural? Uh, is that what might account for uh, differences in billings despite similar number of patients? I think there are several things that could account for it. Um, one could be the type of patients you see or the type of referrals you get. So for example, if you have a very complex patient that you're seeing, you get the same fee code, even if it took you a half hour to see that patient as opposed to five minutes. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that those more complex referrals are preferentially sent to female physicians as compared to male physicians because the uh, presumption is that females are maybe more understanding, will spend more time talking to the patients, and they may see a greater number of these types of referrals. As you also suggested, there are um, patients that you see that are referred for procedures, and procedures are much more lucrative. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that if you're referring someone with a procedure, it's more common to refer to a male physician as compared to a female physician. We also, when we talk about ophthalmology, we use it like one term, but there's a lot of different ophthalmologists. Like we're so subspecialized, retina, glaucoma, cornea, plastics, pediatrics, neuro-ophthalmology. 
And these different subspecialties have different um, billings as well. And we know that, say, retina, for example, is probably one of the higher billers within ophthalmology, but it's a male-dominated area. So I think that might partly be contributing to the differences we find in ophthalmology. Um, you were mentioning about billings, and there is a lot of suggestion in the literature that females tend to bill less aggressively than males do. And in fact, there was a study um, in JAMA Surgery 2019 by Fahima Dossa, who looked at Ontario data of surgeons, and she was looking at how much surgeons earned per hour. And one of her findings were that the male surgeons in general seem to be a little bit more aggressive in their billing as compared to female surgeons. And the other area that I'm very interested in are sex differences in surgical volume and OR access, because I think that that might also be a big player in the differences that we're seeing. Icon wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. I'm Phil Hooper. I'm the president of the Canadian Ophthalmological Society and I listen to and enjoy the ICANN podcast. So Vaughn, we're, we're touching on this a little bit and, and we'll touch on this more, you know, the, the experience of a, of a female ophthalmologist throughout her career and, and you've touched on um, the experience with regards to colleagues. I'm, I'm wondering if you have any comments about the way a female ophthalmologist might be treated differently than a male ophthalmologist from patients themselves. Um, have you had, do you have any experiences to share or any thoughts about the way a female ophthalmologist might be treated differently from patients? I think that that has slowly been evolving, and I did see it evolve during my career as well. But certainly at the beginning, um, when you're a female, you really have to, um, in my, in my um, experience, prove to the patient that you're competent. They're expecting you to be understanding um, and to be compassionate, but they sometimes are not really expecting that you are going to be the expert or, or um, the best surgeon, which I find kind of surprising, especially in ophthalmology, which is such fine, delicate surgery. I would have thought people would think women would be very um, adept at that. But I do think that there has historically been an impression by patients that, um, that male surgeons may be better than female surgeons. But I, I do think that that has been slowly changing. I did have experience during my training that, you know, you would enter a room and you would be mistaken for a nurse. And um, they said, when is the doctor going to come in? But um, yeah, again, fortunately, I, I hope, I think that that's evolving, but that certainly has been a stereotype that I've experienced with patients on, at, at certain times. It is evolving, but unfortunately it still happens. Uh, Ivan, can you tell us some of the discrepancies on operating room resources? Why are they being experienced and how do we correct or pivot to support women in ophthalmology? Kristen McAllister, um, she did a study with me a number of years ago, 2014, and we surveyed Canadian ophthalmologists to look for lifestyle differences between the different sexes. And one of them was asking about practice patterns. And the, there was no difference in practice patterns between the sexes in terms of um, what people said about how many hours they worked or doing laser refractive surgery, hospital affiliations, university appointments, et cetera. But the difference that we did find was in OR resources. Over half the women reported having fewer than two days in the OR per month as compared to only a, a one third of males saying that they had less than two days per month in the OR. 
So from that study, again, um, I find surveys are sometimes limited because you don't know who is responding to the survey, how accurate is the response, but we can look at this OHIP billing data and we know what surgical codes are. So as a follow-up to that, together with Jonathan Masili, we looked at um, billings and looking at the e-codes, the surgical codes in Ontario, and we found that 40% of female ophthalmologists never build a surgical code compared to 30% of male ophthalmologists. So that's pretty significant. We then looked at those that were operating, that were doing cataract surgery. So already we knew that females were less likely to operate than male ophthalmologists. But for those that were operating, we saw that the volume was much higher for males as compared to females. And in fact, in the final year of the study, males doing cataract surgery were doing 1.7 times the volume of female ophthalmologists. So this suggests to me that there is an issue with the access to the operating room for female ophthalmologists. Now, our younger ophthalmologists have often um, commented that they feel that they are um, not getting as much OR time as they would like. And we do know that the demographics, the representation um, by sex in ophthalmology, there's more women in the younger group than in the older group, right? Because that's just changing over time. So it's possible that some of this might also be age related, but um, you have to wonder if it goes even deeper than that, if there's also some type of a sex discrimination as well. In your experience, is there a way to correct for that? Is there something that we can do? I think we have to first understand it. Is, is there a system issue going on? Is it a sociologic issue? Is it something that, you know, perhaps the women don't want to operate as much as men want to operate? Or is there some type of unperceived bias happening? So I think that we do need to study this a little bit more deeply. And that's um, actually coming up into work that I'm involved with currently. I'm not sure if you're aware of a paper that was published in Clinical Experimental Ophthalmology from a, a coming out of Australia. That was in 2021. The lead author was Hannah Gill. And it was very interesting. They were looking at their trainees in Australia and they found the female trainees completed over 40% fewer cataracts than their male trainees at the end of their training. So that makes you wonder, are these sex differences that we see in surgical volume now, are these being traced right back to residency? So because of that, we are right now um, looking at the surgical logs at the University of Toronto residents, because for the past few years, they've been doing quite um, extensive logging of their surgical experience, and we're comparing the sexes, and it's very preliminary work right now. I'm doing that together with Tanya Trin. She was actually an Australian cornea fellow who was familiar with this study and suggested that we look into that and also Rada Coley and David Yan. David Yan was very involved in creating this system of documenting what the surgeries um, the residents were doing. And so far on our first pass looking at it, we found that our female residents did 8% fewer cataracts than the males. Now 8%, it's not large. Numerically, it wasn't a large number either. And it's really, I think, unlikely to be influencing their competency in doing surgery. But there was a small difference there. And then if we looked at it in different ways, like if we knew the average number of cases a resident did, 481, well, 58% of the female residents were below that average compared to only 31% of male residents. So it shows that there might be some, something happening. I'm not sure, is it on the resident side that the women are not leaning in enough or are more, um, are more easily to say, I don't feel comfortable and, and have the staff take over? Or is it coming from the staff side? It's really um, difficult to understand, but there is something going on at the residency level as well, which I think is going is being carried on into practice. Let's go back a bit 
to the unexplained gender gap. So what I'm hearing is that there is some sort of gender gap bay that can be explained by differences in how women and men work in ophthalmology. But I know that you've also been updating Canada's ophthalmology workforce data, and currently you have an article in press in the CJO around this. Is there any relationship between these two papers in terms of future workforce planning? Yeah, I think that's a, a really good question because they do need to be considered together. They're highly related. So I've done a lot of work in the area of workforce, and that was done at work together with Lauren and Bell, Lauren Bellin. And we just recently re-looked at all those numbers. And it's really an important exercise to do because we all want to know, do we currently have enough ophthalmologists to serve the population? And what about going forward? How are things looking um, in the future? One of the challenges we have is what is the benchmark? How many ophthalmologists do we need to have? And we always hang our hat on this figure that was um, uh, given by the Royal College in 1988. And they say you need 3.37 ophthalmologists per 100,000 population. Now, how you know, accurate is that? You don't then take into account what your population is. And for us in ophthalmology, what's really important is that population 65 and older, because they have much more complex vision needs. So I think to just look at an entire population may not um, completely address this issue of do we have sufficient ophthalmologists. But getting back to this other area that we're talking about, what about on the physician side? I think we need to consider how individual physicians are working. So if you just look at head counts, you may really be missing the point of, do you have an adequate workforce? Because if in your head counts, the proportion of women is increasing, and we've been seeing that women may not work um, as many hours as men in term, using the metric of OHIP billings, then you might need to be training more people to take account for that. So I think that that's very important to consider. In the workforce data, we have looked at those headcounts um, because that's really the only benchmark we have. But we also look at the age of ophthalmologists because people work different by age and we are looking at sex differences. So in 2020, that was the last year of that study, 73% of ophthalmologists were male and set 27% were female. And you might think, well, that's great. And the proportion of a female are increasing in ophthalmology. But it's a little bit surprising when you look at in all physicians in Canada, 44% are female, family physicians, 49%, and in specialists, 39% are female. So ophthalmology only having 27% females seems a little bit low. So in that study, we also tried to understand why that was and went back to the entry level. And in the past 10 years, when you look at the PGY1 class in, um, across Canada, in all of medicine, all areas, 56% are females. But in ophthalmology, only 42% are females. When you compare to all surgical specialties where 50% are female. So for some reason, again, females are not choosing ophthalmology as um, much as some other areas. And I think we have to try to understand that. And I wonder if that could also have a relationship in what's happening in, in billings. Is there something that is discouraging for women from choosing ophthalmology. And then that also translates into issues that we see in getting maybe surgical time and then ultimately in billing potential. Have you looked at that across the provinces? How does it compare from one province to the next? Well, we've only looked at the proportion or the representation of females across the provinces. And there is a huge difference I think you probably realize in Quebec, they have the highest proportion of women in ophthalmology, over 40%, and they really are driving up that national average. Um, and most of the other provinces are below that. 
Thanks, Yvonne. I wanted to take a step back a little bit and, and maybe get a little bit more personal. So, you know, anyone who evaluates your career, Yvonne, would say you're very accomplished, really, by any metric, and, and you're admired by so many of us. That being said, I'm wondering if you could think of any experiences throughout your career where you felt like you might be facing discrimination based on your gender. I think I, in the most part, I've been very fortunate in my career. We um, talked a little bit about potential discrimination from patients, and I had a few experiences with that, but it wasn't really overwhelming. Um, in my professional life, um, I joined a group and I was the only female there. And for many years, I was the only female. And I think that most of them um, really were embracing me, but I did feel some difficulties, you know, especially um, when it came to having children. Um, so I had my first child during fellowship, my second child when I was in practice, and there was, there was nothing available for supports for that. It was at a time when the OMA did not give you parental assistance as well. So if you didn't work, you weren't getting paid, but you still had to pay for your secretary, pay for your office space, and you were worried about your operating room time, what was going to happen with that, what was going to happen with your patients. And I, I felt that that was a very difficult time, and I didn't have anyone to speak with about it because there weren't any other females around going through that experience. And my male colleagues, although again, I can't say they were unsupportive, I felt uh, many of them never really came out to give me support during what was a, a very difficult time. Thanks for sharing that, Yvonne. And, and I, I know that things have, have evolved and, and in many ways and in a good way, uh, but I, I can tell you that things are, are very far from perfect even today. Um, uh, having recently gone through the process of planning a, a parental leave myself, although shorter than, than the average parental leaves taken by other colleagues, uh, you know, our the medical practice is not set up for a parental leave um, in any way. And so it was really enlightening in a, in a sad way for me to see how much of a struggle it is to, to set up time to, to be there with your family when, uh, when you have a, a child. So, so thanks for, for sharing that. Um, what is your advice to young women interested in pursuing career in ophthalmology? You mentioned that perhaps women are, are less likely to choose ophthalmology. So what would your advice be to those interested? Well, I certainly hope that this discussion doesn't discourage anyone from choosing ophthalmology, it doesn't discourage anyone and women from choosing it. Because although we are talking about sex disparities, there is improvement and I can see it when I look at the statistics and I've lived through it and I've seen these improvements as well. And I'm very confident that there will become a day when we have especially more women in ophthalmology that it's going to be improving itself and there will hopefully be a time when there'll be no sex disparities. So my advice would be it's a wonderful career, ophthalmology for either sex, but a wonderful career, especially for women. And I think if you're interested, go for it. In life, don't let your biggest limitation be yourself. You need to go for it. Nicely said from a pioneer. Um, <laughs> how, how can the younger women practitioners ensure that their voices are heard that they are respected and given an opportunity for equal surgical time, equal pay. What is, what is your thought and how do you advise them? Um, again, probably a little bit similar kind of going for it. I think it's important first to prove yourself by your actions. So you, you work hard, you show that you um, are, have the ethics, the morals, that you're going to be there doing your part, doing your call, et cetera, taking care of your patients. Um, but then you also need to be prepared when you think that a situation isn't fair for yourself to lean in and you have to advocate for yourself because no one else is going to. You know, um, you were asking earlier about during my career, if I experienced things and, you know, we all experience some and I can just 
turn around and say, well, it was sex based because I was the only woman there. And if I experienced it, I could blame it on that. But it wasn't always the case. But there were times when I felt that I wasn't getting as much OR time as was fair. And I leaned in and I just went to the chief of our department and I said that and they look at it and they said, you're right. And they gave me extra time. So um, you shouldn't some always mull over things and think that that's just the way it is. Sometimes it's just asking and all you have to do is ask and you might see a change happen. Yvonne, the many accomplishments you've had, is there something that you feel stands out as most impactful regarding moving the dial and advancing the cause of these gender-based differences in ophthalmology? Well, I think that what's been most rewarding is when I hear things like Mona saying that, you know, I may have been a, a mentor towards her as well, because I did feel that during my training, there weren't a lot of women that I could use as role models. There were a few, but um, I didn't always find that all of them were very approachable. Um, and there were a lot in my cohort and we could talk to each other, which was very beneficial. But I think yeah, having the opportunity to show by example of what women can achieve um, has been very rewarding for me. And in fact, culminating in receiving the American Glaucoma Society Award for um, International Scholar, that was um, a very big moment in my life to feel um, that people have seen me, that I've been heard. Yeah, definitely a mentor and quite ad a lot of admiration towards your work and all you've done in ophthalmology in general for glaucoma, but also for women in ophthalmology. So. Congratulations on a wonderful career. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I love that, Yvonne. Uh, you know, one of my favorite questions when I was in, in training was asking some of my senior mentors who their mentors were. I, I just found it such a, the answers were often so enlightening. And one of my senior uh, female uh, faculty members uh, at Baskin Palmer, when I asked her that question, she looked at me and chuckled. And she said, what, are you, what do you mean? I had nobody to look up to uh, that was female. I was the first female doing almost everything that I did. And, and, you know, you don't, you don't realize that, or I, I hadn't thought about it. And, uh, and it was really eye opening to, to know that, that going through her training, she felt like there was nobody that was, you know, uh, paving the way for, for what kind of career she wanted. So, so I, I, I think you're echoing that as well. A final question I have is what is your advice to the hopefully many male allies out there that are interested in advancing the cause of gender-based differences in ophthalmology or in medicine? Well, you know, I sometimes felt bad when we ran women in ophthalmology that we didn't allow men to be there because I think it could be very useful um, because some of the issues that we talk about for women, I think some men share those same issues as well. But I think it's just being open to the dialogue and um, just being sensitive that sometimes there could be differences and to try to be encouraging, especially for um, your younger colleagues, especially for the trainees. Because when I see with that data that I was showing for our female trainees in ophthalmology, maybe um, the senior surgeons who are supervising them need to be more sensitive and encouraging. And if a female says, you know, I've never done a case like that before. I don't know if I want to do it. I think maybe the senior surgeon, male or female, should say, well, this is your opportunity to do it and um, try to encourage them to get out of their comfort zone. Thank you. And I'll take that as a plug because you are chair of the annual meeting. I am chair now of the annual meeting and women ophthalmology is now open to men. So all ophthalmology men are welcome. That's good. We have one final question as we always close our podcast with a question outside of ophthalmology. We would we like to ask our guests about some of their non-professional life activities. What books are you reading? How do you fill your downtime? What are your hobbies? Well, that's a good question for me, because my life has certainly transitioned quite a bit in the last few years. And although I had a wonderful career, 
Um, I did decide to retire at a younger age because I do have a lot of ideas of other things that I wanted to do. And I found that my career was really taking over my entire life. So I keep myself busy now by um, I had started up a hobby farm. So I have, in addition to a very large garden, I have a number of animals. I have bees, laying chickens, meat chickens, turkeys, rabbits, and pigs. And um, so I spend a lot of time with that. And that's been a, a lot of fun. When I retired, I was very lucky. My colleagues uh, gave me a beautiful camera for birding. My um, my partner, uh, Graham Trope, was a bird watcher, and he kind of got me interested in that. So I've started birding and bird watching, and I actually write a weekly column in our local paper called Look What Flew Through the County. And I'm considering actually now making a book because I've been doing it for two years, and I've got a lot of a lovely collection for that. Mm-hmm. And now with uh, COVID restrictions easing, Travel is becoming a bigger part of my life as well. And I've just returned from the Camino, which was something I had hoped to do when I first retired because I thought it would be a nice stepping stone into retirement. But because of COVID, we had to delay it. But I just came back from my 800 kilometer walk, which was um, a, a really good experience to it, an opportunity to reflect on the past and consider what my ne- the future, the next steps are going to be. It's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that with us. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us, Yvonne. That was such a fantastic conversation. Much appreciated. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. I can wants to know what you think. Please send your comments on today's episode or any suggestions you may have for topics or features to communications at cos-sco.ca and we'll try to incorporate them into future episodes. Season three of the I Can podcast is brought to you by Bayer Ophthalmology. Thank you for your support. Thank you to the Canadian Ophthalmological Society. The ICANN podcast is written and directed by Kim Teitler and produced by John Allaire from Allaire Strategic Works.